conflict. We all handle it differently. And all of us are gonna face it as leaders, as spouses, as parents, as employees. Some of us have a tendency to run away from it, others to run towards it. If I was transparent, I am typically a run towards it kind of guy. Uh, I tend to get a little excited. Regardless, in the last year, I, I think the area that I really wanted to improve in, both within my personal life and also within uh, my professional life as a coach and in helping other coaches is this area of conflict and how we engage in it. Because it's what I've identified as probably one of the biggest areas for growth uh, of leaders and their teams. So like I usually do, I just try to go and study the experts when I feel like I need to learn more in a certain area. And I pick up every book I can find on the topic and I read it. And one of the best books that I came across was Getting to Zero by Jason Gaddis, who is a relationship coach guru. It's a phenomenal book. And then I invited Jason to join us in the podcast to discuss the book further and to help us make some applications to coaching so that we can help our teams, we can help our players, so that we can grow as a coach. So that's who we have the privilege of having on the Coaching Culture Podcast today and next week episode. My friend and co-host Nate and I welcome you back and welcome all new listeners. Before we get into today's episode though, Nate's got some exciting news, a little something that we've been putting together. Nate, you want to tell everybody about it? Well, JP, I appreciate you asking me that. You and I have been talking here for a while now about trying to find new ways to serve coaches both in our community as well as coaches that are struggling with some hard things in coaching and so we're going to launch this spring here the the last wednesday of march through the uh beginning of april here a cohort of coaches uh, combining some that are in the toc community as well as those from the outside just to collaborate to share with each other to have a bit of a mastermind group around uh the book the tough stuff by cody royal uh, seven hard truths about being a head coach and over those four weeks we're gonna have uh, both a group call uh, weekly on those Wednesday nights as well as some interaction on a on a message board during the week where we can ask and respond to questions and experiences from each other really learn from each other uh, ways to handle some of the challenges that we face uh, more and more frequently in coaching and that uh, is going to include talking about how we establish and protect our identity uh, how we avoid falling into the comparison trap, how we deal with criticism and the pressure and expectation to win, uh, and, and so much more. And so I'm excited to uh, to see how this is going to work. And uh, I know you wanted a little bit of the specifics there as well, JP, that uh, we're going to open this up to 15 coaches uh, to bring together to learn from one another. Uh, a small number of those uh, will be limited to those that are in our TOC community. And we're just looking forward to building a great discussion group and hopefully uh, being able to learn and explore uh, together through Cody Royal's work, uh, as well as sharing uh, our struggles and our triumphs uh, with one another, hopefully to grow uh, and be better equipped to handle some of the challenges of being a head coach. If this is something you're interested in, be sure to head on over to tocculture.com forward slash cohorts, where you can learn more and sign up. Uh, we'll also have links in the details of this episode. Just a quick note, we've got an early bird registration price and there are limited spots. So, uh, and if you happen to listen to this podcast, this episode, um, after the fact, you know, um, go ahead, still check it out. We'll be running these periodically and we can get you into the next one. This is a great professional development opportunity for you as a coach, as a leader, as a teacher. So we also recommend uh, getting your employer to pay for it and we're happy to help in any way we can to make that happen. This round of cohorts will start March 30th, Wednesday evenings in America. You're not going to want to miss out. Now, let's head right into our conversation with Jason Gaddis. Well, Jason, I am very, very excited to have you here on the podcast. Your book has already made an impact on my life. I'm just going to share quickly with a story with you here. I would say in all my arguments with my wife, I always, even if I am justified in my initial point, I lose the high ground and I lose it quickly because I am not, not good when it comes to conflict. Um, but it has helped me significantly and I've seen a big change. So kind of initial reason is uh, I reached out was, you know, personally 
uh, how your books impacted me, but I mm. also because I see how it can help teams. Now your your book is called Getting to Zero, and I was just hoping that you could start by just explaining a little bit about what getting to zero means. Yeah, and thanks for having me on, guys. Getting to zero means getting back to a good place after some kind of snag, conflict, disagreement, fight, argument. It's really just getting back to a good place, which I call zero. How did you get good at this? Obviously, because you're working with other people, and I've read your book, and you weren't great at it for quite some time. But how, how did you get be become good at getting to zero? Yeah, and I, I would just put a little asterisk there. I'm I'm not always good. I fall down just like the rest of us, right? And I the, maybe the difference is I just keep getting back up, and I I have a lot of tools at my disposal. Um, yeah, I I got good with because I I don't like being in a bad place with someone. I don't like how that feels in my body. I don't like how that feels between us. I feel anxious. Um, I just don't like it when I my wife and I are disconnected. Uh, my day's harder. And I feel like the climb is steeper in my life. And yet when I'm connected to my partner and to myself, I feel like I, I'm way more capable to meet the challenges in my life. And that's kind of the present answer. The historical answer is I you know, grew up in a family and lived kind of a life of conflict avoidance uh, most of my life and just didn't know what to do. Had lots of connections and friends eventually. But when things got hard or sticky between two people, I just ran the other direction or I would point the finger at them. And that, that, that created an enormous amount of pain in my life to the point where I you know, finally realized I was the problem. So that's kind of the short story. You mentioned uh, just how you value connection there in relationships. And I think everybody, you know, coaches, many of our listeners are in the industry because they enjoy the connection that they have with their players. And a couple of the terms that you use kind of as you started unpacking some of the things in the book was the difference between connection, disconnection, and reconnection, and how sometimes individuals will be more upset about a lack of connection or the process of reconnection. Like it's not the same for everybody. And I wonder if you could just sort of unpack that a, a little bit for us. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, I call that the conflict repair cycle where and I, I sort my assertion here is it's going to go on the rest of your life. The rest of your life, you're going to have conflict with the people you care most about, family, friends, partner. And that's not a problem. But how you reconnect is the issue. And a lot of people don't know how to reconnect. They, they have inadequate tools. They, they resort to their, the low-hanging fruit um, that they've always done growing up, uh, which is blaming themselves or the other person. And uh, reconnection yet, uh, through research, what we know is that if you can get good at the re reconnection part, the repair part, uh, man, you're going to build stronger, more secure relationships. And that's kind of what I want to, you know, help people, humans get better at is conflict's inevitable. Let's get better at what do we do after the conflict and how quickly can we recover? And I continue to see time and time again in my own marriage, my kids, as well as the people I work with, that when you recover and you learn how to recover well, you're building more resilient, strong humans uh, and people and relationships. So there's a quote in your book that I absolutely love, and it really resonates with me as a coach and as a parent, uh, which is from Mr. Rogers. It's being able to resolve conflicts peacefully is one of the greatest strengths we can give our children. I think that just speaks exactly to what you were talking about there. So you know, already our audience being coaches, I wonder if you could uh, give them just, you know, a starting point of, you know, what would you want coaches to know? Like, what would be your, your, your base point if you're working with a coach and they're not good at conflict within their team? Yeah, well, I'd say if they're not, if you coaches out there aren't great at conflict with your team, your team is, you know, not living into their potential and they're probably never going to be an all-star team. It's the differences and the adversity and the challenges between us that actually create stronger teams, in my experience. So I think it's imperative that coaches get more okay with it in themselves because then they become better at facilitating it between two students, say, or two, two team members. Um, it's just immense. And I, I think we owe it to kids to, if, if it's not happening at home, and all parents in a way are coaches, and if parents, you know, a lot of coaches, I'm sure, dealing with 
kids whose parents are kind of a mess and they're not doing the work and they don't, you know, know how to do conflict either. So the very least you can do is get better at it so that this kid has a chance at learning how to become a better team member, a better team player. Cause I mean, in life, everywhere in life, if you can be a better team player and team member, which includes knowing how to work through challenges together, man, I, I think you're unstoppable. Uh, so yeah, strong plug for coaches out there learning how to, you know, just the basics, how to be a better listener, how to help um, a, a student take responsibility for their part in the dynamic. Like any of these little skills can go a long way. There's, there's one word you mentioned there, Jason, earlier, and I think it was um, a reflection on how you used to handle conflict, which is avoidance, conflict avoidance. Yeah. I feel like the coaches that I even support, um, that's kind of most coaches kind of default um, when it comes to conflict within their staff or oftentimes conflict with players. It's, 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 you, you know, there's some coaches that might be really aggressive and, you know, take it on, but oftentimes the, those coaches that really value the relationships, the ones that are listening to this podcast and that we work with conflict avoidance seems to be, you know, their most common default approach. Why is that? Why is yeah. that the default approach um, for us as humans to just, just to kind of avoid it? Yeah, that's a really important question uh, because I think when we understand why we avoid conflict, then we can start putting one foot in front of the other and learning it, learning how to work through it. And I'd say there's a few main reasons. Number one is biology. Um, our, our biology is why wi we're wired to connect. We're social mammals and we're wired to connect and belong. And one of the worst things for a social mammal is to be kicked out of the herd or not included or cast out or rejected. That's very threatening. Um, in fact, to a small infant, it's life-threatening, right? You could die if you don't have people taking care of you. So it's in our biology and it's deep rooted. Uh, so when we're at odds with someone, it's like, that's kind of what's potentially at stake. Another one is our history. And our history is we might've grown up in a family where interpersonal stress, conflict, challenges between family members, if it didn't go well, um, you know, we could have gotten hit or ignored or rejected or made fun of or shamed. And all of that is also threatening. And then if we haven't dealt with any of that stuff and we get into an adult relationship or other relationships that are high stakes, that history is now, it's like coming in a, as a memory in our body. We have all these unresolved traumas and conflicts and now we're dealing with this person in, our, in the here and now in front of us. And all of that's also in the way and could be at play. So that's complicated. And then finally, another one is um, we're not taught. You know, I, I don't know about you guys, but I wasn't taught how to work through conflict in school ever, uh, college, high school, middle school, anywhere. In fact, the story I tell in the book was I got in a fight in sixth grade and the teacher just told us to apologize to each other. And that was kind of the end of the conflict. And obviously that did nothing to calm my nervous system down the next day or for weeks on end with this kid in the same classroom. And, um, you know, it was pretty damaging for me you know, there was just no, like, how do we get back to a good place? That wasn't even a thing. So I think those are the three main reasons why it's understandable why we might avoid conflict because there's a lot at stake and it feels terrible, right? Maybe that's the last reason. It just feels really uncomfortable. You talk in the book and you, you mentioned, you know, coaches just being able to do some of the little things there. And when we think about our own, our own personal histories, whether it's our family history, our relationship history, you know, I think with coaches, even it's their history with their teammates, you know, when they played, right, mm -hmm. can have an impact on how they're coaching today. And I wonder, you know, what are the first steps or are there are there guiding questions that, you know, can, I guess, incite a self-reflection? Because you talk about self-awareness kind of being that first step. How do you encourage somebody that maybe, you know, doesn't have that awareness to start thinking a little bit differently about their own approach to some of these conflicts that they find themselves in. Yeah. I mean, if we can tie it to what they care about. So let's say a coach who's maybe a little asleep here, or just, it's not hip to that. This could actually be a strength and a real asset. Uh, I think we can say, look, if, do you want to win? Uh, a lot of coaches might value winning and other coaches might value. It's not about winning. It's about becoming a cohesive team. Um, it's about learning to just play together. Maybe that's the success right? Everybody's got their measure of success. But if we can tie the outcome that they want to um, 
working through conflict being a helpful uh, facilitator and maybe accelerator to get to that goal. I think, you know, most people are going to say, oh, that makes sense. Okay. I, I see what you're saying. And if, so it's like almost like enrolling them into that vision or selling them on that idea. And, you know, I think most well-intended coaches might, might be able to buy into something like that. That's one idea. I'm curious what you guys would think too. There's, there's one thing that um, I came across in the book that I really absolutely love. And I thought it's applied so well to coaches on this inner conflict, right? So I think this awareness of ourself and our history is like, like Nate said, but I also think uh, what I really resonated with, you actually challenge the reader. You say, think and reflect upon your daily choices and actions. There's a difference between what you want your values to be, your true north, and what they actually are, your magnetic north. And, and I, I think that's brilliant because I see a lot of coaches struggle. And I think that's why we listen to this podcast. That's where my change was because as a coach, I said, I value these things. I put them on the wall. We put it on the back of our t-shirt, right? You know, like we're selfless, we're competitive, we're right. love and care. But yet then you look at my behaviors and the way I live my life and it's not really <laughs> modeled in that, you know? And there's, yeah. I think it's, it values what we say is values our definition of success. Oh, I want to make an impact on kids' lives. Well, at the end of the day, I mean, I think there's, there, they don't always line up because when I go home, I'm miserable because we lost, you know, like, you know, like it's right. not about the relationship. So I was wondering if you could speak to that because I just, I, I just enjoyed that section so much and it made me think of so many coaches. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, thanks for picking that up. I, you know, maybe it's a quick story here, which is I grew up in a sports culture in my family. My dad was a three-time All-American ski racer. He was a varsity golf athlete in college. Uh, he was extremely skilled and hardworking and competitive as hell. And I was a sensitive, emotional kid. And I wanted my dad's love. So what did I naturally gravitate towards? I got the message, my sensitivity, my emotions weren't so cool in the family. And what was way more cool was me competing, performing, trying hard in sports and learning every sport I could. That got love from my dad, right? So I started playing the sports he wanted me to play, specifically tennis, golf, and skiing, because that's kind of what he was into. And I got pretty good. And, but I was never going to be a champion because I was in his values, not mine. Right. And I, I imagine you guys see this a lot uh, as coaches is you see a kid who's so freaking talented and they're so good, but they just don't want it inside. And it's maybe sometimes it was like me, it's because they're doing it for someone else. Right. Or they're doing it to get love from somebody. Uh, or they're doing it because some girl said that was sexy, or they're doing it because um, that's what their culture tells them to be. And until we determine, find out and you know, make a dedicated path to becoming who we are, we run the risk of being in other people's values, which creates a massive inner conflict. And the inner conflict in me growing up all those years doing his values was I, was, I had low-grade depression all the time and anxiety because I just, I was like, not being myself, right? And then I got a lot of validation and approval for how, what an quote, athlete, you're such an athlete, you're so talented. I got that all day long for years. So I believe that's who I was, but I couldn't deny eventually in my late twenties, I couldn't deny the misery inside. And this is why I used a lot of drugs and alcohol in my twenties is because I was trying to medicate the pain away because I didn't want to deal with it and I didn't want to feel it and I didn't want to admit you know, essentially that I was in someone else's value. So it's a, you know, it's an important point of the book. I think it's pretty, pretty critical for athletes, uh, excuse me, and coaches, because you probably, I'm guessing you guys deal with this, right? You deal with a kid who's probably not doing it for themselves. Like curious about that story, because I, I think about that from a couple different perspectives, man, I've got a four-year-old and a seven-year-old at home. And, you know, as a parent, you think about, you start to reflect differently on how you were parented and how you want to play that parental role for your kids. And, you know, when you think back to that experience, I would guess, and this may not be true, but your dad probably wasn't trying to intentionally say, Jason, this is the only way I'll love you is if you become a <laughs> great or, or a tennis player. But at the same time, that's the message that you received. And, you know, we were talking a little bit off air before we started here that you've got a couple of kids of your own. And I'm yeah. just curious how that's affected the way that you've tried to approach parenting your kids with that knowledge. Yeah, man, it's it's tricky. Uh, you, as you guys know, as dads, I I so want 
you know, my greatest intention is for my kids to be who they are. And it's just natural that kids look up to us, right? And they, they want to be like us and they're, they start to gravitate toward our values because naturally that's what we're doing all day long, right? So I love nature. So naturally my son's really into nature. Um, it, now is, is he into nature because he loves nature or is he into nature because that's what dad loves and he wants dad's approval? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a really interesting question, right? Um, but I, I, I feel like my wife and I are very mindful about continuing to listen to who they're becoming and to when they push back and they don't want to do something, is it like, okay, you're afraid to try this or you genuinely just don't like it and it's not who you are. And I do think it's important that we give our kids as many experiences as possible so that they can find out what they're into, right? And it might be the same as us and it might be totally different than us. And then that becomes challenging. I see a lot of parents, I've worked with parents for years. I see a lot of parents, a very easy and understandable parenting, you could say mistake, but it's just understandable, is just wanting your kid to kind of live out your unlived life and wanting your kid to um, go farther than you did or wanting your kid to um, not make all the mistakes you made. And so you put them in the same scenario so, so that you can work through this thing, but through them, and which is not so good for kids. What's interesting there is you, you talk about the importance of creating emotional and psychological safety in the book, right? And yeah. I think when you, you think about the role models, or I think of my own parents, you know, I didn't have parents, I look back and say, oh, my mom and dad made it, made me feel psychologically safe at the dinner table to tell them things that they may not want to hear, you know? And yeah. I think for coaches sometimes, I mean, I see it in this way, we have, this is a small example, but we have a lot of multi-sport athletes at our school that love softball and, you know, they love football or they love another sport besides basketball, what I coach. And I know a lot of coaches that say, you know, don't ever set a volleyball, don't ever talk about volleyball, don't ever wear a volleyball shirt to a basketball practice. And the message that goes along with that is that part of you is not okay, or it's not welcome mm -hmm. here. And mm -hmm. that's not helpful either. Right. And so I, I don't know if you could speak to the, you know, how is it that coaches or us as parents can create that place where kids can safely explore kind of who they are and, and who they want to be. Yeah. It's such an important question because we also, if it's like so spacious, it's like, Hey, be whoever you want to be, do whatever you want to do. Like kids don't, they don't know necessarily the options, right? We have to show them what the options are. Sometimes we have to take them to the swim lesson that they don't want to go to. Sometimes we have to put them in an uncomfortable social situation to be on a team that they're like kind of scared about and they're feeling really insecure about. You know, it's tricky because, you know, I, I, I look at, um, here, here's a way I like to think about parenting and, and I parent my kids with love, which to me, love means challenge and support. So I'm not just supporting love is not equate to you can do anything you want in life and I'll just be here for you all the time. It, it includes challenge, which is no, you're going to go learn how to swim. I don't care if you like it or not, because I don't want you to drown. Right. And, um, and I hear you, you have some feelings about not wanting to go to this sports camp or the game or whatever, and you're going to go. Like sometimes we have to challenge our kids to the point where they overcome an obstacle and, and start to believe in themselves, right? And then it's this delicate balance of sometimes we need to listen to their no, that it's really legitimate. And they, you know what? They, we've been trying to put, fit a square peg in a round hole for a year. It's not happening. It's not working. It's just, it's clearly not who they are. And can we respect and honor that and let them have a voice here? Because I think when kids are allowed to express their feelings, express how they feel about a sport or something, we start to um, become a safe place where they can express that. And then it's, a, it's not about us solving the problem. It's on them to solve the problem, depending on their age, of course. Uh, and that alone, that wrestling with the decision or, or solving the problem or the dilemma is hard for kids. And it's hard for parents in particular to let kids struggle in indecision and not knowing and being into it one day and not into it the next and being patient enough to kind of hold the space and let them figure it out. That is hard for adults and parents to watch that. Um, so we have to get, I think as big people more okay with discomfort, watching other people struggle. Yeah, I want to follow back up too on that, because I think, you know, you're, there's this challenge as a coach, you know, you want to create a team. And so often when we think of team, it's like, it's everyone kind of has to sacrifice you know, and, and buy into this way of doing things. And I think 
there's probably a little bit more freedom within teams now, you know, as far as like, you know, wearing different shoes and different hair mm. color, but like, you know, I, we grew up in the era where it's like, everyone's going to wear the same thing. And there's all like this conformity and we're all the, we all going to mm-hmm. look the same, right. Cause you're not an individual, you're part of a team. Right. And I know you work, you know, with, with teams out there in the business world and stuff like that. So I was wondering if you could speak to maybe just that challenge as a coach. Like, I don't want too much individualism, <laughs> you know, like it, too much individualism, then it suddenly becomes all about that person. And it takes away from this culture where, you know, we're all about the team that we're trying to create. Yeah. That's another, uh, clearly you guys have thought about this stuff a lot because you're asking such good questions. Um, well, I, I want to bring it into like an, a marriage uh, and then maybe we can expand on it in a team because a marriage is a team. And when you sign up for marriage, you're, you, um, you're getting into a different conversation with different rules, which is it's not all about you anymore. Right. And it's the same on a team. And I, I didn't know how to collaborate. Honestly, uh, it was all about me before I got married and then I got married and then we had kids and it was like, oh shit, man, I am in the weeds here. Like, how do I, how do I collaborate? I am actually quite a bad collaborator. And over year, over the years, I've gotten much, much better to the point where I see that collaboration and teamwork and being, doing it together is better than doing it alone often. And there's a level of maturity, right? A person has to make in that journey especially if first if someone's really individualistic like I was and we're in an individualistic culture still that's very much pro independent like me and me myself and I I'm going to do what I want and it's my life and authentic expression and all this stuff which is again great but can be challenging on a team and not everybody is cut out to be on a team you know not everybody's cut out to be in a long term marriage and that's okay and I do think the I don't know why I'm thinking of Dennis Rodman as, as an example of like how hard it must have been to wrangle that guy in to be a team player. Um, and Phil Jackson did it like somehow. It's just like kind of amazing. And yet sometimes there's someone who's just not really cut out for a team. And at a certain point, depending on the, the level of the sport or the, the game or whatever, it might, n- there might need to be a hard conversation about that. Look, you can choose to keep being your quote authentic self here or you can prioritize the team. What are you going to do? Uh, and yet the strange thing is, and this is, I think why you're asking is the strength of a team is when all people are in their zone being themselves. Right? So it's interesting because I think any musician, especially in a band environment, like I have to, if I'm the bassist, I, I got to stick to my instrument. Like, and, and if we're going to create the music that we create together, I got to really just go in and be me but I can't do it at the expense of the team. So it's, it's, gosh, it's just this, uh, I love the question because I don't know how you all wrestle with that uh, as coaches and people who teach coaches. Cause I think that's one of the, maybe the most biggest cruxes of a, of a team, perhaps that, that question right there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, it's, it's a, it's a constant challenge. I mean, I've seen even in businesses, um, you know, my, my wife works for Google and they're always looking for, googly people like they have a term like there's a certain type of person if you're not googly you're not getting the job you know like Uh it's just as you're trying to build and sustain culture uh of the team you know you try to find people that fit that type you know um so there's always going to be a bit of molding and shaping there it's it's a big challenge you know there's some things that i i want to unpack about how we can help our players to deal and improve in conflict there's one more question that i want to ask you a little bit about how your own journey, because I think, you know, it's so important that we as coaches grow first in this area before I think we start to try to help others. And you talked about that story about your dad and how, you know, your values were tied up in his values and how you had to break free from that. When you told that story, I thought of the, the player that becomes a coach and I, Nate, Nate never played basketball or it was very, very limited. Mm -hmm. And it was so different than my experience where I played all the way through high school, my identity was completely wrapped up in basketball. And then I went and played at the University of South Carolina. So when, and I'm, I'm more of like the traditional, like you, most guys play their, their at least through high school and they go on to be a coach, right? Yeah. So I fit more of this traditional thing. And then there's a struggle, I think, for individuals that play a lot and their identity is wrapped up in there because they get to the end of their playing days and it's like, okay, now what do I do? Well, I guess it's go be a coach because there's, that's all I know. Like it's basketball, stay with my sport or whatever sport we're coaching. 
Mm-hmm. And um, that may not be, you know, like they may not have already had a healthy relationship with their sport to begin with. And then they go make a career out of it, you know, long-term career as a coach. I think they really, really struggle with that uh, identity being so tied up in the sport. And I was just yeah. kind of curious if you could share how you went, maybe some tips for coaches that struggle with that to, to maybe unpack some of those inner conflicts uh, that they might be experiencing around that kind of like that identity crisis. Yeah, cool. Another cool um, inquiry here. Let me start with my journey again, coming back to me and my dad. So I decided one day, you know, this isn't for me. Late high school, I was starting to kind of feel more individuated and like, okay, I can be my own person here. I quit tennis and golf. That felt like freedom to me. I was still on the ski team. I went uh, to ski race my freshman year of college. I got on the team. I went to a couple, you know, practices and I was like, I'm out. And And there's a longer story there, but what's interesting is as I went on a journey to find out who I was, I, I, and I, meanwhile, I was becoming, I became a ski coach. So I stayed in my sport. I got a job as a ski coach at the same team that I was on as a kid. And I started coaching the younger kids, you know, four to 10 year olds. And I ran the developmental ski team. Well, and I loved it. And I didn't love it though, because of skiing. I loved it because I loved being a coach. And I loved connecting with the kids and I love children. So, um, and I love the relationship part of the coaching, you know, and parents would come up to me after and be like, dude, and I, I still do, to this day, remember a guy who said, you should become a psychologist. Um, you're so good with kids and blah, blah, blah. And I, I never forgot that because I was like, what? I didn't know what a psychologist was. Right. Well, fast forward 10 or so years later, I'm studying and, and I become a psychotherapist because I want to work with people and teenagers and their families. And then I eventually became a coach. So now I'm a relationship coach. And it's just so interesting, right? So I, you could say I just changed sports, um, but I had to find my way, right? And I, I think you started the question with like kind of this, how important this self-reflection and like going on your own journey as a coach before you help kids or as you're helping kids. It's like really knowing, is this my sport? And, and maybe you're coaching because you could care less about the sport, but you love seeing teams congeal and you love working with children or kids, and you love um, helping teams come together, and you just love that process. Well, give yourself permission to do that and stop worrying about what sport it is or what activity is, and just go all in on the the project of building teams. That's maybe your jam, you know? So I think there's there's a lot of room there if we, because I think we're probably the best coach when we're being ourselves again, right? Kind of like when we're the best athlete is when we're being authentically who we are here to to be expressed as. That's something we've talked about on the podcast before. And when I went through a, would you call it a career crisis, JP, when I lost my job and then had to find another one? But, uh, you know, asking the question of, I know that I love coaching. I feel like it's the best fit for me, but I never, it took me 18 seasons to sit down and think about why do I really love it? You know, what are mm-hmm. the aspects of it? And landed on a very similar place. It's it, the game is great. I love the game of basketball, but I love the relationships that are built through the game of basketball, you know, Mm -hmm. and I think now in starting a new program here, as I have this past year, even for the first time being a head coach with that knowledge, it's made me different, you know, and it's made me better and it's made me more appreciative of um, creating opportunities for those to happen for myself, but even within the team, you know, and, and um, the teammates to each other, if that makes sense um, to allow those things to thrive. And, and it's been, more fulfilling, I would say, than, you know, trying to operate without that knowledge previously, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's so cool. So I'm hearing you got, you got really clear after a a lot of seasons, why you were really into this, right? And once you got clear, it seemed like it opened up something more for you and even probably more fulfillment and meaning came in and yeah, that's powerful. All right, we're going to take a break from our conversation with Jason. There's a lot to digest there. Uh, Check out Jason Gaddis in the meantime at relationshipschool.com or on Instagram at Jason Gaddis. He's also got a great podcast, The Relationship School, and a phenomenal book, Getting to Zero. Also, don't forget Nate's cohorts. Those are just around the corner starting at the end of March. You can learn more at tocculture.com forward slash cohorts. Thanks for listening to the Coaching Culture Podcast.